We have been talking about Bible evidences. And I mean actual Bible evidences, not science. But we started with the things that the Bible says about itself from the physical realm that bear witness to God, the seasons and cycles, the nature of creation, things that we all have access to, uh, the sky, the seasons, the uh, turning of day and night, um, all things that are available to all people for us to be able to see that there is a God, there must be a divine power, there must be a timeless divine power um, to create time and everything that we call nature. We also talked um, on Bible evidences about the um, jars of clay that are the means by which we have received the word, by which we mean the human beings who wrote these things down or transmitted them perhaps, or um, spoke them, the, the mouths that God used to make these things. And how that, whether they're good or whether they're evil, doesn't matter and cannot stop God's purpose speaking through them. Well, today we are looking at the fact, the internal nature of God's word itself, saying that there's nothing like it, and this is also the case. I realize there are sometimes, um, there are sometimes uh, emotional pleas. I remember studying with some Mormons one time, and they made these emotional pleas to read the Book of Mormon, you'll find that it's not like nothing else. You know, pray God to open your heart and you will feel it. Um, that's not what we're saying here. That's not biblical. But it's true that God's Word, not the Book of Mormon, the Bible, does contain truth and does speak in ways that other things do not speak. The Bible is very self-aware of the impossible things that it records and how that God is uh, the one who makes all things possible. But also, there is this self-awareness of astonishing sayings from Jesus. We look at the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, which is really the sermon after going up on the mount and coming back down, the same way that Moses went up on the mount and came back down. And Moses came down with Ten Commandments, and Jesus comes down with uh, Beatitudes. Right? But Matthew 5, on seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and began to teach them. Um, you know, fast-forwarding just a bit here, in chapter 7 of Matthew, you see in 28 and 29, when Jesus had finished saying these things, which is, you know, it starts there at 5 to quote him, and he quotes them all the way to Matthew seven twenty-eight. When he finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, because he was teaching them as one who had authority, not as their scribes were teaching. Well, what do we mean by this? Well, we have picked one example. There are many things in that text. Uh, we picked one example in verses 27, 8, and 9. I think this is a useful one for teaching what, what we're getting at as far as how does he teach with authority? How does he teach differently from the scribes? Well, he is taking the word of God and making it uh, real with regard to the choices you make in life, but he's also enforcing it and tightening it so in Matthew 5, 27 and 29, he said, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. Well, yes, that's one of the commandments. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. This is just one example. Okay, but if you look at it closely, it contains all of the elements of what we might characterize as teaching with authority. You have heard it said you shall not commit adultery. And he has uh, 
it's between the lines, but when he says, but, <laughs> there's a certain way of presenting this that he is countering. He says, but I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So what's happening with the scribes is, <clears throat> well, the Bible says, do not commit adultery. And then somebody says, well, what's adultery? And then they define it as some specific act that you take. And then they say, as long as you don't do that, you're okay. <laughs> so the lust that's ahead of it, the flirting, the floating balloons, the things that people do, the staring, all that kind of stuff, they're just fine with it in their teaching. The way that they teach it, they're just fine with all of that. Jesus' teaching is rather clear. It is said you shall not commit adultery. But instead of saying that is, you know, where the jurisdiction of God begins, <laughs> he is saying that's not a place to go, so do not get on that road. Here is the road. The road that leads to adultery is looking at a woman with lustful intent. So do not get on that road is the teaching of Jesus. Now that's authoritative because it's showing you how to stay out of sin. Not just if you do this thing, there's a penalty. But here's how you keep from doing this thing. And he follows it up. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. No, I don't think he's speaking literally because it won't help your heart to harm your body. It's a heart matter, the lustful intent for somebody else's woman or a woman who does not rightly belong to you. That's a heart matter. But his point, I think, is clear even if it meant maiming yourself or doing something damaging like taking out an eye, that would be better than going to hell. And that kind of teaching is the urgency that we're talking about, the authority that we're talking about. He's saying, look, there, there is a reckoning, there is a judgment, there is something to pay for acting like that, going down that road. And he said, look, if you have to, you know, if it could help, to take out your right eye, that would be worth doing. That's all he's saying. Better that than to go to hell. Better to lose one body part than the whole body being thrown into hell. This is an example of authority, not like the scribes. The scribes were looking for ways out and ways to permit almost everything except for what is explicitly forbidden. And that's never been the way of a person who loves God. The person who loves God does not want to get on the road that leads to breaking the commandment. And Jesus' teaching is this way. There's nothing like this. He brings the judgment in. He brings the severity, the sureness of it into the teaching here. Shows us how to get, how to stay out of trouble. And then, frankly, it, you know, if you come to this word as an adult... Uh, certainly for the first time, or whenever you first become aware of what Jesus is saying, you realize that he has got your number. He does know how you think. That's one of the things that happens as you read through the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount. Um, you realize that Jesus knows what you think and how you think. He knows what makes you tick and how you work. As you read these things, he's getting you. <laughs> You read them and realize, oh, that's that I've done that before, or I've thought that before. And it, it, it pierces the heart, and there's nothing like it. So yes, when he finished saying such things as these, the crowds were astonished. It's an astonishing teaching. There's nothing like what Jesus does. And again, we're not making an emotional appeal, a subjective claim I'm saying, look at this text, listen to what the Lord says, and realize, you will see, it is not like anything else. One of the other things that we find in the Bible, 
said about Jesus' teaching is John 7, an episode that we will read together here momentarily. But it says there, and I have <laughs> put my own translation here, no mere mortal spoke thus. <laughs> because it's silly to make my own. So I made it silly language. But you get the idea. The point is not a silly point. Jesus is not just a man. And they knew that by how he spoke. So John 7, 14 to 18 records, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, how is it this man has learning when he has never studied? He's teaching. His teaching is effective. He has learning. But how did he do that? He's a carpenter. He's not part of the intelligentsia. He's not does not have the nod of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. Right? That's what they're saying. He didn't go to Florida College. How can he preach? And Jesus answered, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority is seeking his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of the one who sent him, that one is true or faithful to the original. In him there is no falsehood. Right, so Jesus said, this teaching is not mine, and I don't seek my own glory or speak from my own authority. I seek the glory of the one who sent me, that is the Father who sent him. And that is what makes that message true. That is, there's a, uh, I guess in musical lingo, lingo, you would say that's high fidelity. Um, he said, if your will is to do God's will, you will know whether the teaching is from God or whether it's of a human origin, if you will, speaking on his own authority as a man, not as God, though he is both God and man. He could, it was possible for him to have done the wrong thing, and he did not do so. He chose to speak by the authority of God, to speak the teaching that was not his own, it was from God. And if you want to understand it, you have to want to do it. You don't understand it if you don't want to do it. But as he said, the one who seeks the glory of the person who sent him is true or, you know, high fidelity, whatever you want to call it, accurate. In this one, there's no falsehood. And that's Jesus. He seeks the glory of God who sent him. He is transmitting the message with high fidelity. This is the answer to the question. Remember, the <laughs> remember this is the answer to the question. How is it that he has learning when he has never studied? And he says, in some sense, I don't. I'm just saying what God wants me to say. Right? How does he have learning? He said, well, the teaching's not mine. It's the teaching of the person who sent me. If you seek the glory of the one who sent you, well, then you're being truthful. That's all he's saying. A very simple answer, actually. But who talks like this? <laughs> who addresses the people and says, it's not my own, it's God's. The power is in the word of God. John 7, verse 30 and 31, you read, they were seeking to arrest him. But no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. It's just like Samson, he just shakes free. Yet many of the people did believe in him, and they said, When the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? As in, how could this not be the Christ? The rulers are telling us he's not, but how could this not be it? Will the Christ do more than this? Good question. 32nd verse, the Pharisees heard the crowd muttering this about him. The chief priests and Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. And the account says in 45 to 46, they came back empty-handed. Why did they come back empty-handed? 
Well, they returned to the chief priests and Pharisees, who said, Why didn't you bring him? The officers answered, No one ever spoke like this man. John 7, 46. No one ever spoke like this man. Why did you not bring him? Because no one ever spoke like this man. Well, you know, that's true. No one ever spoke like this. This is interesting. This is different. We did not hear anything like this from other teachers. And it's what we looked at earlier, that this is astonishing to them. But there's more to this. What these officers are saying is something much more precise, and I think it needs to be pointed out. Um, yes, the translation says, no one ever spoke like this man. But literally, it says, never spoke thus a human. This is the Greek way of um, emphasizing. You put the human at the end of the sentence, and it's the anthropos, the human, as opposed to the animal or the divine. So when they say, never spoke thus a human, what they're saying is, this is not a mere mortal. That's what they're saying. Never did a human being talk like this. This is not a mere human being. There's something else going on here. That's what they're saying. And actually, you see the same thing happen later in John. And, you know, John has these repetitive cycles, you know, and some of the same elements show up again and again in different forms and in different intensities. When they go to arrest Jesus, they said, he says, who are you looking for? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am, which is usually translated, I am he. I don't think that's right. He's saying, I am, the way he had said in John 8, before Abraham was, I am, which is a reference to Exodus 3. Lord, whom shall I say sent them? What should I tell them is your name? He said, I am who I am. So Jesus very clearly claimed to be God in the flesh. There's no question about it. When they went to arrest him, and the, he said, who are you looking for? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am. They fell to the ground and cowered before him. Remember, that's the record. Why? Because he just told them he's God, and they already know he's God. Because they heard him talk. And the Pharisees said, why did you come back empty-handed? And they said, because he is not any mere mortal. I'm not touching that thing. I don't know what's going to happen. That's what they're saying. That's God. I'm not touching that. They're afraid. And they're right to be afraid. But this is the thing that gets lost, you know, and they say, no one ever spoke like this. And you say, yeah, his words are great. Well, it's true. His words are great. But what they're really saying is no human talk like this. This is no mere mortal. That's why they came back empty handed. They're afraid to touch him. And you see it, like I say, you see it when they go to arrest him, too. They're afraid, as they should be. And their fear uh, was foreshadowed by Elisha if you're willing to think about it this way. This is an aside. But in that account where they fall in fear, they cower in fear before Jesus when they go to arrest him. It's like when the king sends to Elisha to arrest him or bring him and the troops climb the mountain and fire consumes them and then a second troop climbs the mountain and fire consumes them. The third troop comes up, you know, on their hands and knees... <laughs> <laughs> afraid of the Lord. <laughs> that is Elisha. He's a type of Jesus, no question. He got his request of Elijah. If I see, you know, as Elijah said, if you see me going, he asked for that double spirit, double portion of the spirit. He got it. He's the type of Jesus, no question. All right. You get the idea. Hebrews 4 is the other thing we will say about this, or another thing we will say about this. No creature is hidden from his sight. The fact is, as we alluded to earlier, that the word of God is a distinct thing. The Bible is a distinct thing unto itself. 
So many people talk about the Bible, but don't listen to people talking. Read it for yourself and see what does it say? What does it contain? And perhaps you will be shocked at how well God knows you and how much he knows what is in your heart and how you think and how you operate. That's how God's word works. It's a, it's a strange thing to contemplate, and we're going to contemplate it here. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. No creature is hidden from his sight. This is what uh, Psalm 19 had said. That the, you know, that the sun runs its circuit and nothing is hidden from its scorching heat. <laughs> That's the idea. God sees everything. But the word of God is living and active. It's not a dead word. And we don't mean by this that it's a living document that is continually being modified. We mean, you might think it is a book that's sitting there on the shelf or whatever in your in, in memory on your phone, whatever it is. <laughs> but it's not. When you read it, it is engaging with you, whether you realize it or not. It is alive. It is active. I say it's kind of a weird thing to contemplate, and I'm not trying to sound like some kind of a weirdo talking about aliens and cattle mutilations and whatever. No, that's not the case. What we're saying is the Word of God has this power and this ability. When you read the Bible, God is interacting with you. It is living and active. It is engaging with you in your spirit and in your mind. And you may not realize it, but as you're reading it, God is talking to you. It says it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Well, the two-edged sword cuts both ways, you see. <laughs> That's the nature of that. It cuts both ways. And sharp though a sword may be, and it's ridiculous what is possible with a sword. Uh, I, I cannot believe, when I saw a demonstration, I cannot believe what swords can do to people. It is horrible. But the word of God is sharper still. Piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, joints and marrow, thoughts and intentions. What do we mean by this? The division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, of thoughts and intentions. Well, where do you draw the line is all we're saying. <laughs> like, take joints and marrow. That's an easier one. If you had a, a, a rib or a chicken bone, you know, maybe a little leg, leg of chicken, you know, and you... Where does the bone stop and the marrow begin? Have you ever looked at one and tried to figure this out? Uh, it's hard to tell. It, it's such a subtle transition. And, you know, that's the whole point is, is there much difference between the joint at the end of this bone and the marrow inside of the bone? Like, how do you transition from one to the other? You clearly do. There is a center there that is marrow. There is an outside there that is a joint, which is very different from the shank. But where, when, how does it transition? Where do you draw that line? That's hard to do. Well, it's all that it's saying. God's word does pierce down to that division. It is so precise, is all we're saying. Soul and spirit. Well, in, you know, uh, the soul is the life force here on earth. That's your maybe breath of life, if you like it. But the spirit, of course, is that eternal essence that we are, the eternal being. And yes, they're intertwined, right? We make spiritual decisions. We make spiritual thoughts. We use 
our breath to sing and to pray, and those are spiritual things in addition to soul things, I guess, if you think of the soul as the, the breath of life. Where is the division between them? <laughs> now, that's hard. How do you say, I mean, there's clearly such a thing as, well, you know, when you breathe your last, you're going to die in the flesh. And there's clearly such a thing as, you've been dead for some time now, your spirit exists still, that it goes on beyond the body, yes. But in between the two, where do you make that division? That's hard. Thoughts and intents of the heart. Same thing. When the heart thinks about a thing versus when a heart makes an intention to do a thing, pretty hard to tell the difference. Although we just read a great example in Matthew 5 with Jesus saying, whoever looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery in his heart. There's something that's more than a thought, something that's an intention. And regarding that, particular teaching. Uh, it's true, biology has wired you, especially if you are a male, you are visually oriented. There's almost nothing you don't see. That's a thought. The question is, what is the intent? Do you look away? <laughs> That's the question. No creature is hidden from his sight. All are naked and exposed to the eyes of whom, to whom, uh, of him to whom we must give account. I mean, the word of God is going to cross-examine you. It's going to find you out. It knows everything that's happening. It reads you. You think you're reading it. It's reading you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a remarkable thing. I think, too, it's interesting um, to think about this Hebrews 4 thing and parting. Um, that uh, that the Lord knows what we're doing and provides this mirror for us, and that um, it's different every time you look at it. Every time you read this book, you see something more, uh, perhaps something else, but something more. It's never the same when you look at it again. It's always you're always renewing the mind by going back to the scriptures and reading again. You know how long has it been since you read Job, or how long has it been since you read the Psalms or the Proverbs or Ecclesiastes or Second Chronicles? You know, read it again. There's more things there. And I've had favorite books before. Um, you know, my all-time favorite is Moby Dick. But I also like Invisible Cities, uh, excellent little modern fiction. Um, but they're not the same thing as the Bible. I mean, yeah, if you read it again, there are some things you forgot about and some connections you make that you maybe didn't see, but that only works two or three times at the most. Same thing for listening to a piece of music. First listening, second listening is definitely a thing. Third listening is a thing... Pretty much like all the rest of them. That's not the way God's word is. It doesn't matter how many times you go back to the Bible. There's more there. Every time you look at it, there's more there. It's constantly shifting and changing in front of you. Not changing character or nature, but there's more there. God knows. God is working in it. People want, you know, proof. They're demanding proof. Well, the Bible is the proof. Read it. You have no idea... How crazy this is, what this book can do until you read it and realize that, yes, God God is looking at me. I, you know, I think that I'm reading this book, but the book is actually reading me. That realization is true and important if you are going to repent, if you are going to turn, if, if you're going to realize your accountability before God. Okay, so finally, Matthew 13 we say, in regard to the nature of the Word of God, it is better than everything else. Which I leaked into a little bit, talking about Moby Dick. But Hebrews 13.44 is one record. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. 
It's like treasure hidden in a field. If you find it in the field, well, that's a great joy. There's treasure here. And so he finds it. He covers it up. Why? Because he's intending to buy it, and he doesn't want anybody to take it from him. It's that important and worthwhile. In his joy, he goes and sells all that he has to buy that field. Meaning that the treasure of God's kingdom is greater than everything you have. You do so joyfully, giving up everything in order to obtain the kingdom of God. That's true. I love Moby Dick. I, I love, uh, you know, box Toccata and Fugue in D minor. Um, you know, they, they always ask you what one, one piece of music you get to take with you to the desert island. Absolutely. No question, box Toccata and Fugue in D minor. Nobody's done anything since then. You music theory people can argue with me later. Nobody's done anything since then. Nothing new. <laughs> but it's true. In joy, he goes and sells all he has to buy the field. It's worth everything, and he gladly gives everything to get it because he knows that it has a surpassing worth, a surpassing value. And in 45 to 46, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all he had and bought it. Very similar. But in this case, this person is a connoisseur. This person knows something about, perhaps, wisdom, justice, truth. He's looking for the truth. He wants to find, or she, wants to find the truth of God. And when they get there to the Bible to the kingdom of God where the Bible is taught, they go and sell everything to buy that. All the other stuff that's being labeled wisdom, knowledge, truth, is false. This is true. This is real. And this is also the end. Today, if you are not a child of God, you need to obey the gospel before it is too late realizing that you are standing in need before him, that, that you um, are walking in sins and need forgiveness. You need to repent. You need to turn to God. You need to make things right with God by obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins. We have water ready. We will help you to obey him in baptism for forgiveness if you repent, realize your guilt before God, and need to prepare for the judgment day. Today, if you are not a child of God, we will help you. But today, if you are a child of God, we will still help you. If you need our prayers, if uh, you're facing temptations, we'll help. We also are facing temptations. We also need prayers. And this is the people of God, the truth that we uphold. Let us build each other up and come together and please the God in whose name we assemble. Today, if we can help you with our prayers, if we can help you obey the gospel, let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.